Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. I'm Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events. What a pleasure to have Anthony Doerr return. He was last here for his endlessly best-selling Pulitzer Prize-winning miracle of a book, All the Light We Cannot See, a novel about a blind French girl and a German boy navigating the carnage of World War II. The novel also won the Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction and was a National Book Award finalist. Doerr's other works include the novel About Grace, two story collections, and a memoir for which he has earned five O'Henry Prizes, the Story Prize, and a Guggenheim Fellowship, among other honors. A novel of the interconnected tapestry of human experience, Cloud Cuckoo Land weaves together the lives of a 15th century orphan, an octogenarian in present day Idaho, and a girl on an interstellar spacecraft decades from today. As with all the light we cannot see, a world of endless beauty and imagination beckons. Tonight, Mr. Doerr will be in conversation with the redoubtable writer and editor, John Freeman, whose books include How to Read a Novelist, Tales of Two Americas, and Tales of Two Planets. His forthcoming book of poetry is Wind Trees. And this past year, he edited the anthologies There's a Revolution Outside My Love with Tracy K. Smith and the Penguin Book of the Modern American Short Story, editor of Granta until 2013, and purveyor and creator of Freeman's Biannual. The latest issue is out now. He is an executive editor at Knopf and teaches writing and literature classes at NYU. John, Anthony, it's great to have you here. The screen is yours. Thank you so much, Andy, for that introduction. Uh, Anthony, or as Tony, as people call you, Really nice to see your face. Um, it's been quite some time since I've seen it in person. Um, although um, one of the nicest things about the last decade is every now and then exchanging a card through the mail and the magic of just seeing your handwriting on a, on a piece of paper that could have emerged from Italy or some other country around the world. Um, welcome, where are you coming from today? Oh, thanks, John. I'm in home. I'm at home in Boise, Idaho, and you're in Vancouver, Canada, right? That's right. And behind uh, the screen, there are some boats traveling across the water. Um, but what we're here to talk about is uh, your new book, Cloud Cuckoo Land, which um, I think is better than Google Maps. <laughs> uh, do, do you remember the first time that you used Google Maps? And you Absolutely. could drop the little pin in and then the sort of every, everything rescaled? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Google Earth in particular. Remember, yes. that was like this revelation. Remember a friend showing it to me and I was like, oh, this is new. Yeah, this plan, this this book you edited here, the every like this plan of this corporation to map the world down to the centimeter, like to have these gigabytes upon petabytes of data of the earth is happening. You know, they're going to map every single inch of this place. So it's terrifying, but it's also kind of extraordinary too. Yeah. Well, we've been doing it for centuries and centuries and cloud cuckoo land is sort of a, a tribute to that curiosity, to that endless desire to see and, and pay tribute to, and to know the world we're in. Um, just briefly for those of you who haven't read the book yet. It's it's kind of like all the light you cannot see times two. Um, it's seven plus years in the making. There's five storylines. Um, it calls up all the themes that Tony has worked with over the years, metamorphosis and grieving, memory, and why we need to remember where we're from, the urge to kind of travel and see the world, the passing down of crafts, our bizarre quest for immortality, the great war in modern memory. The way a book can enter your life like a key and the way that a quest story can really pull you through and this book be, you know begins in the 15th century in constantinople and it sort of transit across 592 years to uh, a, a journey which is happening in the 21st century on a plan uh, on a spaceship which is going to a new planet hopefully um, a journey which in itself will take 592 years um, and there are paired storylines. There's two 13-year-olds on the opposite sides of a wall in Constantinople. One's a failed seamstress, and the other is a, a boy with a cleft palate and a kind of curse behind him. And then more towards the present tense, there's a, there, there's a kind of eco-terrorist type late teenager in a library in Boise and a, a man named Zeno, who's named after the first librarian, who's 
teaching, uh, or sorry, putting on a play uh, in that library based on um, a story which threads through this whole book called Cloud Cuckoo Land by a, a fictional uh, ancient writer named Antonius Diogenesis. Um, and this boy has walked into the library with a determination to say something about the environment. And then of course, in the, in the far future, there's a, a, a girl named Constance who's on this trip into the outer space. And I mean, as you can tell from just having to bring all this together, this is a very difficult feat of engineering you've pulled off. So, um, you know, were you trying to kind of put together a unified field theory of the world or, or were you simply just trying to challenge yourself to say something new about the world as we live in it and, and, and the threat it faces, it, it faces today? Yeah. Oh, John, you're so kind. Thanks so much for all the years of support. You're such a gifted reader. Like, thank you. You're noticing so many things in the book. And it's so gratifying to hear you recognize them. So thanks. Uh, yeah, I mean, you don't sit down and think now I'm going to write a book of everything <laughs> that first day. But I'll try to, since we have the time, I'll kind of walk you through the genesis of the whole project. So this, this book, which folks may be tuning in because they know about, is set about, I don't know, 60% of it is set in this town called Saint-Malo in Brittany, France. I was so ignorant about, when I first went there, I was so ignorant about Brittany. I thought Brittany was in Britain, but it turns out it's in France. I'm walking those streets, and uh, the first thing that really confronts me uh, beyond the beauty of this town and the massive tides, especially low tide, there's these enormous stretches of beach sometimes the tide retreats three quarters of a mile where the walls the, the medieval walls that had to be mostly rebuilt after this severe bombardment in 1944 but now as a tourist you can walk along the ramparts about two kilometers and walk the circle of the old city and you feel as though you're walking through a medieval town and as I decided to set this novel there and started reading about the, the history of walls and particularly its function in Hitler's huge megalomaniacal project to build this enormous wall. Apparently a lot of tyrants over time have tried to build walls. His, you know, the Atlantic wall, I'm sure many folks know, try, you know, it's a series of fortifications all the way down Norway's coast, Denmark, Belgium, Franco-Spanish border, 2000 miles, slave labor, millions of tons of concrete are poured. There's still very interesting things to visit now. These, some of these old lonely sentinels, these old guard posts along the way. But every text that would talk about the history of those walls or the history of defensive walls in general would mention the walls of Constantinople. And I don't know about you, John, growing up in Ohio, for me in my high school, the history we did learn was, of course, all Western history. And it went, we went from the fall of Rome. And then the teacher would like take a little sip of water. And then it would be time for the Renaissance and like the age of discovery. Let's get to America and Columbus. And, you know, there's like 1100 years just get snapped past. And so as a kid, you assume, oh, nothing much must have happened there. But I just decided I wanted to learn more about it. So I have, I have some show and tell for everybody. I printed out on my old graduate school printer, I printed out a drawing of the walls of Constantinople, a 15th century drawing. Uh, just taped it next to my desk, just as a kind of reminder that this could be uh, something I wanted to try to chase for my next project. And so in 2014, still doing a lot of promotional work for All the Light, and I start reading these, getting books from the library about walls and the history of walls. And first, let me tell you about the walls of Constantinople. They, they stood for a thousand years, about 1100 years, and the land walls withstood 23 sieges, 23 different armies break against them. There's, there's an inner wall like 50 feet high, an outer wall about 30 feet high, then this moat that it places is 60 feet across that could be flooded at will, apparently, although there's some dispute over whether it was actually flooded during attacks, but it, almost impossible. This really dominant technology, it must have seemed to the citizens of late Byzantium that the walls had stood since the beginning of time and would stand until the end of time. But just like in all the light, where I'm trying to tell a story about a new disruptive technology, in that case, radio, which arrives in Europe and can really overturn existing power structures because it can send voices through walls. In the 15th century, just as the printing press is arriving in the world, gunpowder is becoming prominently used in Europe. And it's always young people who recognize the power of a new technology, seems often anyway. And this young Sultan, 19 years old, 
becomes the head of the Ottoman Empire and hires a founder, this master founder from the country we now think of as Hungary, to found these giant Death Star-like cannons and to drag them to the walls of Constantinople and make them obsolete once and for all. And that, I think, right around the time a presidential candidate is going around the United States leading crowds and chants, build that wall. So I'm thinking about, okay, I think I've got a project here. The, the walls stood for so long that they allowed Constantinople to accumulate insane wealth. The best example I've been able to give folks is that the Hagia Sophia, the great church in Istanbul still, at one point, the mosaic, the gold uh, mosaic in the vaulting, there was four acres of gold inside this church. And visitors, you know, you see like 11th century visitors of Constantinople just writing like, there's never been a city like this in the history of the world. Among all that different kind of wealth that they're able to accumulate inside the walls are books. And so it's like mid 2015 when I'm finally like, okay, I think I've latched onto the electricity of something that I want to write about. But I'm still not at the unified theory of everything. I'm just at that point thinking about Anna, a girl inside the walls who is desperate to read. She wants to learn to read and that she's living in a time when girls aren't encouraged to become literate. There were times in the Byzantine Empire, apparently, that girls were allowed or even encouraged. Wealthier girls were allowed to read. But she's living at the end of the empire. And uh, she's, a, she's basically an indentured servant working at an embroidery bench forced to stitch all day long and so she uses story as a way to try to dream herself out of her own circumstances and then I invented this boy who you mentioned that uh, Omir this boy who's living outside the walls and uh, part of the Ottoman attack the siege of 1453 but it's not okay then sorry you still with me John I feel like I've been talking for 20 minutes oh no absolutely it's fascinating because um you know the the sections that uh when Omir's working outside the walls as the cannons are, are being built are, it's just extraordinary. Oh, you know, it's like, so interesting. The chroniclers, yeah. who knows if they were there, they might be themselves historians and it's all secondary source, you can't tell. But you know these chronicles of the construction of these cannons are so interesting and how it's all verging on the supernatural, you know, melting these things down. The, the, the powder makers work in this realm that seems almost magical to everybody. And it's so amazingly dangerous to try to fit, you know, the, the, the caliber of these enormous 2000 pound granite balls have to fit perfectly or else there could be a misfire, the cannon could crack, somebody could be killed. So yeah, I loved falling into that. Sometimes I get way too into that, reading about all that stuff and realize I'm losing the heart and the momentum that keeps people reading because I just want to put all Mason, all these details into those sentences. I should but, say that this, this book, it proceeds in mostly short chapters, like all the like, um, you cannot see. Uh, so that, that basically keeps you honest, doesn't it? If, if that's your strategy is, is to have the short chapters, like there's no way you can overdo the detail. Maybe, although I'm sure there are readers who might disagree with you. But yeah, I think uh, I'm trying to keep narrative momentum going. I'm trying to basically spin five plates, although maybe six with the fable you mentioned also spinning in a reader's mind. And so I feel insecure if I don't go back and touch those plates pretty frequently. Otherwise, I worry if I've gone 70 or 80 pages without visiting Anna or Seymour or Zeno, uh, the reader's going to start to forget about their predicament and that plate will kind of wobble and fall. So uh, often the short chapters allow me both an easier work day and that I have a sense I can work through 800 words or 1,000 words in a day. But there's also a sense that uh, I want to be able to keep all this stuff swirling in the reader's mind. And the only way I think to really build resonances between all these pieces that I'm asking her to assemble is to visit them semi-frequently anyway. And do you do this uh, strategically? Because one of the great pleasures of Cloud Cuckoo Land is just how you, you have this almost subconscious awareness of the things which are connecting the, the, the stories. You know, it might be, clouds it, it might be uh, libraries which exist in almost every section it might be sounds like songs it might be the the text which appears the fable that um tony mentioned um it might be the sort of quest for research that kind of eventually overcomes almost every character in the book and they sort of go on a dive and so as you're reading you're constantly remembering 
um, just enough about what came before because you're you're touching these nodes. And I'm curious, Tony, when you're writing this, are you are you working subconsciously yourself, or are you gradually going back and sort of dropping these kind of notes in? Yeah. Oh, I'm sure you can, can guess the answer is that it's a combination of all those things. There are moments, of course, say that one, one of the easiest ones is pancakes, like pancakes in some version kind of appear at each of the character's stories. And that's not something like you sit down on a Monday and think, now I'm going to do that. Or, you know, much more importantly, like this idea of flight, flight to a better world. That's what a cloud cuckoo land represents. Uh it's more like when you're doing the dishes, John, or like you're walking the dogs and you're like, what is this thing I was doing all day? And then you start to think, oh yeah, maybe I can heighten a few of those resonances uh, when you're, you're kind of moving back and forth between your conscious mind and your subconscious. I, ever, I think of it as like this long continuum making a book from moving from this writer-based world to a reader-based world. And so each day, hopefully, although it's a really hitchy kind of progress each day you get a little closer to john freeman reading this in vancouver and so uh you start to think well what will he notice so you sleep sleep is like this amazing thing that our brains do and every time you sleep i feel like we comb all this noise and rupture out of the previous day and so in the morning sometimes i become a little more reader when i'm reading through a clunky third draft of something and maybe that's the moment when i become conscious of something that i've subconsciously planted mm. and i try to refine it or maybe heighten that a little bit uh, so and then later in the process and when i'm laying all these pieces these little chapterettes out on the carpet try to understand how they'll work together that's when maybe you can read 80 or 90 pages at a long burst and then you can really try to become conscious of different resonances that you're building and try to heighten them a little bit sometimes i think i overdo that though i'm like let's see if i can cram keys and locks and birds and clouds and you know all this stuff <laughs> Well, it, 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 it does hold together beautifully. And one of the things that I marvel at as a, as a reader and a writer is, you know, I know um, Anthony Doerr's work for, um, in different capacities, but primarily in the beginning as a short story writer, as a, as a science and nature columnist for the Boston Globe. And he would write these beautiful essays about just everyday occurrences. Um, and, you know, from his early work, The Shell Collector, um, About Grace, which is about a hydrologist, his, his work is full of scientists, people who are kind of out there, you know, and when you write about scientists and knowing the world, you, you have this danger of running into a kind of leopardologist, you know, compression of the world into its um, containment. Um, and you can, by including um, people in rational-based fields in, in your work, you can kind of press the mystery out. Mm. And one of the things I love so much about this book is that you're, as you pour us through these various narrative locks, you're constantly pouring us back into mystery, into the mystery of, of being alive. And I, I wonder if you can read a little bit because the, 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 one of the glories of this book are its echoes. And, and, and there's a section that happens early with Seymour who you introduce us, he's in the library, I'm not giving anything away, he's, he's about to commit a terrorist attack of sorts. Um, and then you give us, go back in time and you present him growing up and maybe you could set up what's about to happen. Yeah, you bet, John, thanks. I think my mom, I wish she was tuned in because she would really be touched. My mom is a science teacher and yet she really encouraged us to not see these divisions of disciplines, which in some ways are a little bit artificial, the idea that there's a science building on one edge of the university and the liberal arts building on the other. And I think there are both ways to investigate what it means to be here for this really short time that we're here. And uh, so I think of my work maybe as oscillating between those things just naturally because she'd drop us off at the public library after school and I'd take out whatever, Stephen King or something. And then the same breath, she'd ask us like the Latin name of some beetle we'd find or some caterpillar we'd find in the driveway. And so I didn't think of those things as mutually exclusive. And of course I had so many examples like Rick Bass or Andrea Barrett or Aldo Leopold or Annie Dillard, these writers who were interrogating the natural world and using science, but also using the beauty and mystery of language too. So anyway, thanks, John. Okay, um, yeah, just read a little section. Um, uh, this is Seymour, he's still a really young kid and uh, his, uh, well, they have no money, basically. I think that's all you really need to know. And his, his mom is named Bunny. 
Manager Steve at the wagon wheel says, you bet, Bunny. Bring your kid to work so long as you want to get fired. So on Friday morning, she plucks the knobs off the stove burners, sets a box of Cheerios on the counter, and puts the Starboy DVD on repeat. Possum? She calls him Possum. On the Magnavox, Starboy drops from the night in his bright, shining suit. Touch your ears if you're listening. Starboy finds a family of armadillos trapped in the net. Seymour touches his ears. When the microwave timer says zero, 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 I'll be home to check on you, all right? Starboy needs help. Time to call trusty friend. He'll sit tight. He nods. The Pontiac rattles down Arcady Lane. Trusty friend, the owl soars out of the cartoon night. Starboy lights the way while trusty friend tears through the net with his bill. The armadillos squirm free. Trusty friend announces that friends who help friends are the best friends of all. Then something that sounds like a giant scorpion starts scratching on the roof of the double wide. Seymour listens in his room. He listens at the front door. At the sliding door off the kitchen, the sound goes tap, scratch, scratch. On the Magnavox, a big yellow sun is coming up. Time for trusty friend to fly back to his roost. Time for Starboy to fly back to the firmament. Best friends, best friends, Starboy sings. We're never apart. I'm in the sky and you're in my heart. When Seymour opens the sliding door, a magpie sails off the roof and lands on an egg-shaped boulder in the backyard. It dips its tail and calls walk, walk, walk. A bird, not a scorpion at all. An overnight storm has cleared the smoke and the morning is bright. The thistles nod their purple crowns and tiny insects sail everywhere. The thousands of pines stacked against the back of the property rising toward a ridge seem to breathe as they sway in, out, in, out. It's 19 paces through waist high weeds to the egg shaped boulder. And by the time Seymour climbs on top, the magpie has flapped to a branch at the edge of the forest. Splotches of lichen, pink, olive, flame orange decorate the boulder. It's amazing out here, big, alive, ongoing. 20 paces past the boulder, Seymour reaches a single strand of barbed wire sagging between posts. Behind him is the sliding door, the kitchen, pawpaws, microwave. Ahead are 3,000 acres of forest owned by a family in Texas no one in Lakeport has ever met. Walk, walk, a walk, calls the magpie. It's easy to duck under the wire. Beneath the trees, the light changes entirely, another world. Pennants of lichen sway from branches. Snippets of sky glow overhead. Here's an ant mound half as tall as he is. Here's a granite rib the size of a minivan. Here's a sheet of bark that fits around his midsection like the chest plate of Starboy's armor. Halfway up the hill behind the house, Seymour comes to a clearing ringed by Douglas firs with a big dead ponderosa in the center like the many fingered arm of a skeleton giant thrust up from the underworld. Parachuting through the air around him, blown out of the firs, are hundreds of pine needles bundled in twos. He catches one, imagines it as a little man with a truncated torso and long slender legs. The needle man ventures across the clearing on his pointy feet. At the foot of the dead tree, Seymour constructs a house for the needle man from bark and twigs. He is installing a lichen mattress inside when a ghost shrieks 10 feet above his head. <laughs> Every hair on Seymour's arms stands up straight. The owl is so well camouflaged that it vocalizes three more times before the boy sets eyes on it. And when he does, he gasps. It blinks three times, four. In the shadow against the bark with its eyelids closed, the owl vanishes. Then the eyes open again and the creature rematerializes. It is the size of Tony Molinari. That's a kid in his class. Its eyes are the color of tennis balls. It is looking right at him. From his spot at the base of the big dead tree, Seymour gazes up and the owl gazes down and the forest breathes and something happens. The unease mumbling at the margins of his every waking moment, the roar falls quiet. There is magic in this place, the owl seems to say. You just have to sit and breathe and wait and it will find you. He sits and breathes and waits, and the earth travels another thousand kilometers along its orbit. Lifelong knots deep inside the boy loosen.
I'll stop there, right, John? <laughs> that seems like a lot. <laughs> oh, no, I, I just love that passage so much. And there, I feel like we could spend an hour just talking about so many things in it. And um, I love Ponderosa. Uh, you know, the, the, those trees are amazing. They're amazing. The puzzle piece bark too. There's all kinds of puzzle playfulness in the book. So I'm hoping like one person in a million recognizes like, oh yeah, even the bark of Ponderosa's echoes somehow the structure of this weird book. Yeah, no, they look like they need a moisturizer. You know, it's like, it's like deeply <laughs> fissured, you know, yeah, it's like that's it. Sam, Sam Shepard's face, you know, circa 1995 onward, you know. That's <laughs> that's totally it yeah but I, the the thing i really love is just uh the gentle way that birds come into this book and i i wonder if you know if we could just have a little cul-de-sac to talk about birds and your relationship to them and what you you know you know what you make of them like because they're mythological and they're biological at the same time and they're everywhere but they're also endangered but they're not only endangered Absolutely. And I really, well, there's so many things I'm trying to get at in this book and this unified theory of everything. And, you know, of course, the climate crisis is part of it, but I feel like there's an uh, underrepresented twin crisis that we're going through, and that's the biodiversity crisis, and it's not talked about as much. And so I tried to give a sense, especially in the, the differences you'll see between the 15th century and now, and especially in the future with Constance, is the presence of animals in the characters' lives. And you'll see over Omir, there's you know, curtains of birds and tides of birds flowing around in Anna and Omir's world. And you'll feel a much more, um, you know, stripped down version of that in Zeno's and Seymour's world. And then of course, Constance really only experiences animals through a virtual world on this, in this confinement that she's experiencing. I really got to geek out about the ancients, the, the ancient Greeks attitude towards birds. Um, you know, there were theories early on that birds were immortal, you know, nobody knew where birds went when they migrated. I thought that was so interesting. Some people believe swallows would go to the bottoms of ponds and just sleep away the winter and then emerge in the spring. Uh, and of course, uh, for folks who don't know the phrase cloud cuckoo land, had you heard it before, John? No. Okay. Yeah. I think a lot of Americans had, uh, and, and that's great. That's totally fine with me, but it comes from a play called The Birds by Aristophanes, 2,400 years old. Um, in high school, we read the Odyssey and Oedipus Rex, and that was it. That was like the totality of my classical education. And I always felt really insecure about how I didn't fully understand what people talked about King Priam or something. I never really understood all those references. So the past seven years was an attempt also to try to rectify my millions of ignorances about things. But one of those was the classics. So when I start, you know, first, you know, the kind of the three tragedy writers that people know about are Euripides, Sophocles, and Aeschylus from the ancient world, each have around seven plays out of around a hundred that he wrote that have survived to the present day. But there was a comedy writer too named Aristophanes, and he, we have seven of his plays, although we know that he wrote dozens and dozens. We have titles from many plays that are totally lost. But this play called The Birds is really charming. It's body, it's full of tons of inside jokes that we to don't totally understand that Athenians would have cracked up about but it may be the first utopian Western story, at least that was written down. And it's about these two doofuses who decide to leave Athens because there are too many lawyers. And they decide to, with the help of the birds, they go out in the wilderness and meet a hoopoe. And they decide with the help of all these birds to build a new city in the sky, halfway between the world of men on the ground and the gods in the heavens. And they decide to play this, it's called this place cloud cuckoo land, although it's really Nephilo you know, it's so vastly predates English. It was really interesting to see how it kind of ricocheted down through the pegs of English. It was like cuckoo cloud town and cuckoo cloud place for a long time. It kind of settled into cloud cuckoo land in the beginning of the 20th century. There was a novel in the 20s written called cloud cuckoo land. And a lot of Americans who do know the phrase know it from the Lego movie from their kids, I'm learning. And that's, that was in 2014. There must be somebody with a great sense of humor at Lego who decided to send the characters there for a few minutes, a place called cloud cuckoo land. That utopian story, like all utopian stories, you know, utopia doesn't turn out to be what the characters hope it will be. But something about the birds helping build that, I think, was really moving to me. And, you know, birds are the wild creatures that are, you know, there are, there are plenty of nocturnal birds, of course, but most of them are awake around the times we're awake. And they're the, the wild creatures with which we have the most contact, I think, you know, depending on where you live, 
Now, if you stare at the sky for 50 seconds, there's a good chance a bird will cross it if you're lucky and you live in a nice enough place. And so I think that's, uh, it, it's always been a tool for me. There's so many symbols attached to them, but it's always been a tool for me to say, this is the way my characters can interact with the natural world and with the non-human world. And so uh, I'm always playing around with birds in my work. There's a lot of birds on all the light we cannot see as well. That's but, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and um, in some very cartoonish way, on one hand, you have this human capacity to build weapons beyond all imagining that can end the world. And on the other hand, you have human capacity to, to build libraries and stores of knowledge, which uh, create places where books can survive through endless amounts of time, much longer than canons. You know, those canons are long gone, you know, but we still have all of the antiquities that, that were rescued during um, the Ottoman Empire by translators of which, you know, Anna is one in a sort of way. And this book, in addition to being a, an ode to the natural world and a, a, uh, an ode to libraries, an ode to friendship, you know, Zeno goes to war, he, he, fought, he is captured and him and a British guy, uh, you know, start translating in captivity. Um, it's, it's also an ode to translation. Um, you know, because without translation, we're lost. And I wonder if you could talk a tiny bit about that, because I imagine after, you know, your last novel, you've probably been translated into 40 languages, and that must be a really interesting new glimpse of the world uh, as a writer. Absolutely. And John, you're such a great messenger for world literature and bringing writers into because we're pretty good at exporting writers from the United States. We're not great at bringing them in. And so the more we can read world literature, the more important that is. Yeah, I mean, I'm so ignorant about everything. Like, you know, we were lucky enough to win this thing called the Rome Prize when I was 30. We gave birth, my wife gave birth to two twin boys. And three months later, we find ourselves in Rome, Italy, staying at the American Academy in Rome. There is usually 15 artists and 15 classical scholars of some type there. And that was my first real exposure to translators, people who, who could read Latin and ancient Greek, people for whom the city of Rome is like a book. You can walk around and read inscriptions written everywhere and understand the city so much more deeply than I could. Even just graveyards, even these old tombstones that line the cortile, the courtyard of the academy where we lived and worked, you know, there are so many poignant things written on these things, you know, it's like a carpenter who loses his son and is written in a description, something like, you know, the tragedy of losing a child before you, you yourself leave the world or something, you know, they can read these things. So you realize like, oh, what, you know, I, I would think, of course, the Odyssey was boring or something because the version we read was translated in the 1920s in high school because that was the only copies the high school had. And then you go read Emily Wilson's new translation or now it's I think 2016, 2015. It's one of the first prominent female translators of the Odyssey and it's exquisite. It's like this muscular, moving, beautiful poem that you can read like a novel. You can read it in about three nights if, if people want to revisit it really amazing translation. So you, uh, I started to realize that every generation really needs its translator and, and that the, it's okay. There's really a whole passage about Zeno struggling in his old age to try to get all the esoteric academic details right when he's trying to translate this old book that Anna has saved 500 years previously. And it's really kind of a metafictional statement about when I was going through researching the book, I got stuck too often and trying to make sure every detail is right. And these five fifth graders helped Zeno translate it by basically saying like, where's the humanity? Where's the fun? Like, where's the joy? Let's rearrange these folios so that the story is more engaging. And uh, there's something really, I think, important about that message to all of us, you know, that even when you're trying to take on these huge questions, there should still be pleasure and joy in storytelling. And so the book in many ways is this, well, the book in many ways is like this oscillation between erasure on one side and conservation and stewardship on the other. And of course, translators and librarians are one part of that. I think one other thing that comes into my head while you're asking that question is that when you're a kid, you think libraries are just always there or the Odyssey was just always there, like leaves on trees or whatever. And then when you get older, you realize like humans are making this happen. Like he, he, it's, it's humans that fund libraries. It's human beings who decide like John Freeman, just being a custodian for all these voices. They're deciding 
to keep these voices alive in the world. And um, it's really important. These little acts of stewardship are so important to maintaining human culture. And I think hopefully also for stewarding our planet through the immense change that's coming and already happening now, and that's especially going to be coming in the next decades. So oh, I'm, I'm so glad you, you kind of ended on that, that note, because there's a, a passage in the book um, where, you know, that's in the, in a part of the book we haven't talked much about, which is kind sort of the science fiction future part where Constance is, is on this, um, you know, this, this rocket going 592 years into the, you know, to this, this new planet, um, hopefully where, where human beings can live. Um, and uh, Mrs. Flowers, the librarian um, is, is there and she, she says, we are the bridge generation, the intermediaries, the ones who do the work that our descendants, so that our descendants will be ready. And it, it was an extraordinary compressive, compression of the, the kind of, um, the task that we find ourselves in currently in, in this moment in time. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that task, because we've been talking about it narratively, about culture to some degree, you know, about history, um, but obviously the, the biodiversity of the planet, which Seymour, you know, grows increasingly angry about, you know, 60% of the species being killed off in 40 years. Um, you know, how, how can we possibly tell stories that, um, that make that idea that we're the, the intermediary bridge generation a, a possibility and not just a story? Yeah, great question. This was my attempt to do so. I, um, I get terrified about this word didacticism or, you know, any thing that, you know, is considered preachy. There's the classic, what is it, the filmmaker Nelson DeMille said something like, if I wanted to send a message, I would have used Western Union, you know, that storytelling isn't the place to send messages. And <laughs> I absolutely get that, that, you know, there's a, a gray area between propaganda and storytelling. And you have to always tread carefully when you have any kind of hope to say anything. I just think fiction is the best place to make observations and ask questions. But I did want to try to ask questions about stewardship in the book. And um, especially in those moments like we were talking about when you're doing the dishes and you're like, what is this thing I'm making? That's the preoccupation of my life that has really began since I became a father and watching my kids move through the world. It's been this amazing uh, decentering experiment where you become less important and you're reminded that your needs aren't really as important because your whole job really is to make sure that this is a fit place for them to grow in and feel safe in the way you and I felt safe growing up. And of course, you can't control all those things. You can control, you know, it's almost a myth pushed on us. I know we both re admire Rebecca Solnit. She had a great column in The Guardian about a month ago about how the whole idea of, you know, it's our carbon footprint, it's our individual decisions, is really this whole myth concocted by fossil fuel companies in a way to try to transfer responsibility onto us. So there's, we're limited in how much of change we can make just by composting or riding our bikes everywhere, although we should do those things. But I think I'm also trying to suggest that how can we all start thinking less, a little bit less about ourselves and our own direct immediate needs and more about the lives of the kids who haven't been born yet. And mm -hmm. I think the irony there is it actually makes you happier. <laughs> it's like the more connected you feel and literature for me is the way to do that. Often I, another irony is that you do it alone, but reading often makes me feel more connected to other people and makes me happier. And uh, I think that's the same thing I'm trying to address here is to say, it's through interconnections, through training our imaginations to breach the confines of our own skulls and imagine the lives of others, whether they're alive now, they were alive 100 years ago, or will be alive in 100 years, and also maybe to imagine the value of the lives of other species as well. Uh, I think fiction, maybe it's self-serving for a novelist to suggest that or a short story writer, but I think you know, it is something that that imagination can get trained a little bit through reading, uh, through reading fiction. So the more we can just keep reminding ourselves that and keep telling stories 
not necessarily with a direct environmental message, but just saying like, look at this place, look how short of a time we are here. Mm. And uh, how can we make little decisions that will help protect the security and safety and the potential for happiness of the next generations? Mm. Amen to that. Um, some questions are coming in and one of them relates to some of the things you were just saying. Um, and it's from a, a person named Danielle Lane who was asking, you know, um, how, how you write uh, children so well. Um, and I, I, I sometimes imagine, you know, what Tony Doerr's childhood must have been like. Like there was like a, a, a beeline between the library and, a, and an outdoor park that was very safe and where, where he could explore things because it feels like you have very direct access to what it was like to be a certain kind of child. But what, what are some of the things that you think about when you're making a fictional child rather than an actual child? Like what, what makes them come alive on the page? Yeah, yeah, great question, thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, you're not too far off. I think my own childhood, I was outside all the time. I think you and I are around the same age. Like we, we were the last generation pre-video games. They were kind of starting to leach in, but um, we, uh, my mom taught at a private school. And so I went there and it was about a 45, 50 minute drive each way. And so I had very few friends around where I lived. And so I just went outside all the time and wandered around. And, and my companions were books, usually library books who didn't have tons of money. Uh, so I think I'm so grateful in a way that that's how I grew up versus my kids who are grown up in this wild west of these incredibly advanced algorithms that are meant to harvest their attention all the time on their phones. As in terms of writing kids, you were talking about me writing adult scientists in earlier books, and it's true, I somehow moved to like child scientists in the past two books, and even in Memory Wall a little bit. And I think that might be connected to me having kids too, and and us getting into middle age, where, uh, you know, middle age is about like, suddenly the time starts accelerating, because you have so many habits, you start moving through the world unconsciously in more ways. The easiest example is like, do you remember your commute to work every day if you make the same commute? Or um, it's a lot easier to cook a meal in the kitchen you've lived in for 10 years when you decide to cook an omelet than if you go to an Airbnb and you're like, where's the spatula? I don't know how hot this burner gets. And uh, I love, I am just drawn to art that defamiliarizes the world, that breaks a, apart the habitual. There was this Russian formalist guy named Viktor Shklovsky who wrote this essay called Art as Technique. And he said, the purpose of art is to make the stone stony again. And that's always stuck with me. I first read that in my 20s. And I thought about that in so many different ways. First, like Zadie Smith has a great essay called Fail Better in which she talks about in the micro ways, the way she's kind of convicting herself of failure. She says in each of her books, she has a character rummage in her purse because she's been too lazy to break the habit of pairing the verb rummage with purse. And she's like, well, that's an okay sin, but what if on the larger sense and whole characters or structures, I'm, I'm submitting myself to the habitual. And so I don't know, I just don't want to sleepwalk through my life. I feel so acutely that we're not going to be here that long. So I like to be able to use whether it's art making or art experiencing and reading or watching films or something to try to find things that challenge me. It doesn't mean every day you're able to do that. Some days you're tired and it's okay to watch whatever, an NBA basketball game where you kind of know the rules and you just want to zone out. But there's days you want to watch that weird French movie or days you want to try a crazy writer like Gary Lutz or, or somebody even maybe less challenging but so involving like Amy Hempel where the sentences, the syntax is actually a little bit wrinkled up on itself and it slows your progress down. But it also reminds you of like the magic and the mystery of, of language. So that's a long way of saying, I think lately I've been drawn to younger characters because they approach the world as if it were new. And so they don't necessarily have that accumulation of habit around them. So it's a way for me to approach it the way my kids used to, the way they used to want to say, go to the grocery store because they thought the grocery store was awesome when they were seven years old, you know? And then suddenly you're like, yeah, when you see it through their eyes, you're like, it is amazing. It's this incredible place. There's club crackers in here. There's Cheez-Its in this place. They're like, Please, can we get Cheez-Its, Dad? You know, they help defamiliarize the world for you. So I think that's why I'm drawn to young characters. 
I love club crackers. I mean, I, we could have done the, the last 20 minutes on club crackers. No, they're incredible. They're right? incredible. They're just the perfect mixture of saltiness to the right size, the density. You can put uh, heavy things on it and you can put light things on it. So it's like a, it's a, it's a versatile switch hitter of a cracker. Yeah, or just go plain, just fire yeah. six or seven down plate. <laughs> oh my God. I could have a whole sleeve right now. I mean, just, you know, the only thing that's ever made me feel any kind of sympathy for George Bush senior, um, other than him throwing up in China, um, was, was, was that he on election night would have martinis and saltines. That was his thing. Like that was how he, he, you know, quenched his anxiety. No kidding. What would happen. Oh, and I, I just thought, oh my God. So he, even George Bush senior needs comfort. Um, not that I want to provide it for him, but, you know, I, I want to go back to a few of these questions um, just because uh, I think time is running out and um, I, I'm going to try to combine two, one by C.V. Langer and one by um, Judy Caputo. Um, and, and they're basically about structure. And, you know, the of, you've probably come across comparisons between this book and, and Cloud Atlas. Um, uh, were you influenced by that book? And, you know, are you going to con continue with this kind of multi-pronged structure, you know, that, that um, well, I mean, you've done, you've done in many different forms. Yeah, um, of course. Yes, I didn't. Uh, I read Cloud Atlas when it came out, which is maybe like 2004, 2005, but I loved it. I remember having a conversation with the writer Miley Malloy, and we were both like, whoa, this guy is interesting. You know, it's also much more maybe postmodern than mine in terms of there's all these different forms of delivery. It's primarily first person, but there's an interview. I think there's letters mm. um, from this guy Frobisher, right? There's uh, there's so much cool structural play, but there's also that postmodern playfulness as well. Uh, and I got to do an event with David Mitchell last week for Waterstones, and it was really fun kind of hearing what he's working on now and talking through that with him. It certainly did help me understand that um, readers would be willing to try characters in different time periods. The, you know, the, the anticipation that readers can feel in a book like this, when you have two characters, A, B, spaced far apart, and they seem like parallel lines, but you get a sense a convergence point might be coming because they live in the same time. There's a real advantage for a novelist there. You can use the anticipate, anticipation of a reader because there's a potential for them to intersect because they live in the exact same moment. But here in this thing, you know, there's an, I can't use that because, uh, you know, except for two characters in the present, two in the past, one in the future, all five can't ever show up around the same table in the same time period. So uh, there's all kinds of other things that John's been so kind to recognize all these little rhymes I'm trying to build through different images and themes and questions and uh, these little notes that I'm kind of trying to sound through each of those five characters. But uh, the Cloud Atlas did maybe give me, when I think back on it, it did give me permission maybe to think through that. Uh, as for, well, I tried again, I have no idea. That's not something you can really identify when you're at the beginning of your next project. But I did, I do have a show and tell for you guys to give you a sense of the kind of structural play that like a five part the, well, I don't know what you would call that quinpartite or tri, it's not tripartite, but that multiple structure. So this is an early, I always make drawings to try to understand the things that I'm making. So you can see on this side, you can see the five characters names and the through line of the central fable and all 24 Greek characters, it's divided into 24 parts, alpha to omega. And you can kind of see the braiding of them. Uh, what I was trying to suggest is, and we're gonna get real nerdy here for a second. But John, have you ever heard of Deleuze and Guattari? Do you remember those? Yeah, okay. I barely read them. They, we, I took one theory class in graduate school, uh, but they had this theory, I'm going to say the 70s, but somebody probably is listening knows better than me, about rhizomatic structures. And oh, that's just a fancy word for a rhizome, which is just a fancy word for rootstock. It's basically like, think of an iris. It's a subterranean network of roots with no beginning and no end. It's kind of multiple and horizontally proliferating and it sends up shoots. And uh, they used it as a, as a better, they thought it was a better metaphor for the way human knowledge works than say a tree, because that suggests there's like a trunk and a center to it. And I kind of like that. And there are later theorists that tried to apply it to narrative structures. 
And so certainly Cloud Atlas is probably one example, but by, by many, many means, not the only. Of course, there has to be a beginning and an end to a book, although there are some really interesting people online who are trying different things. But I did think of the rhizome, this underground network of roots as a kind of model for this structure, this rhizomatic feeling, because so many discoveries in the past five years in science have been up suggesting that things that we think are not connected actually are deeply connected. The most obvious one that folks might know about, especially from Richard Powers' amazing novel, The Overstory, or this really cool book called The Secret Life of Trees, is forests. You know, when John and I are growing up, we're taught forests are like, trees are like individuals, very capitalist metaphor, like trees are individuals and they compete against each other and the little ones get drowned out, the light gets drowned out and the nutrients go to the big guys and that's how they succeed. And really what we've learned just in the past decade is so interesting is that forests are really cooperative, that there's symbiosis everywhere in nature, but particularly like here, they're using roots and fungus to send and divert nutrients to each other. And yeah, that's just one example. The other one that I've been using a little bit on the road is the Gulf Stream, because especially when you're on the East Coast, this is a Philadelphia event, the Gulf Stream is this current of warm water up the East Coast of the United States, a hundred, I think it's a thousand times, but maybe it's a hundred times more powerful than the Amazon. And it regulates temperatures in places as different as London and Tampa. And it's rapidly slowing down. And we don't know why, but the latest theory is because we're losing so much ice in Greenland that all this fresh water is pouring into the oceans and disrupting density differences that drive ocean currents. So the the, the weather in, in Fort Myers and the weather in London is connected to the ice in Greenland. It's just astonishing how deeply interconnected all these things are. So I think of that rhizomatic structure as a way to try to echo some of the things that are happening in science as well, these deep interlockings and dependencies that people are recognizing. Wow, I've been reading quite a bit about the cooperation of the species recently. Um, Rick Bass mentioned it in an essay in an upcoming issue of, the, of Freeman's. And you know Rebecca Solnit has been um, talking about this for quite some time, and it's interesting to hear uh, you know writers who might be called naturalists, writers who are activists, uh, scientists, and novelists, you know, all um, talking around certain changes in an idea. You know, because the notion was that Darwin, social Darwinism, was not caused by Darwin; it was one of his cousins who sort of took up and kind of ran with it but um, it became a kind of misused metaphor to some degree. And it, you know, what, what you're talking about is not just simply an issue of how to tell a novel, it's, it's an issue of how to structure a conception of reality and knowledge, which um, in novels mirror, but they can also help imprint us with. In, in that sense, didacticism isn't simply, this character is saying this, and therefore you should be, be, believe this. It's what would happen if humans were not the center of a book, you know, which is one of the things that Overstory is trying to do is decenter the human. And I'm curious, um, you know, as we're peeling off here into the night, you know, can you ever imagine writing a book that sort of pushes humans to the outer edge? I mean, so far, you know, um, that kind of happens a little bit in your memoir where you're supposed to be writing and you just start looking out the window and you just become obsessed with this sort of natural world in Rome and, Pretty soon, your fellowship is like, oh, who cares about writing? I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at this, this, this tiny, tiny bit of weed that's growing in my window, you know. And but is, can, can you conceive of what kind of book that would be? Or are we all gonna be reading novels about, you know, tree structures? That's really interesting. I don't think I can. I, that's gonna have to be a younger person embracing that new technology, the non-human novel. I think I'm still a humanist at heart and you know the humanities are certainly a big core of this novel. But I, I am in such deep, like soulful agreement with Rebecca Solnit when she says nobody's independent. And we, you know, the whole like say Trump's inaugural, which is all about like severing, saying like we can do it alone. It's the Marlboro Man. It's the, you know, one lone Caucasian male out in the West can do everything alone. No, who needs NATO? And you know, I think of the way we are losing species. Like, oh, why does it matter if we lose a species that lives at the bottom of one of the deepest ocean trenches? And yet. 
we are ripping apart a tapestry that we don't fully understand and that we utterly depend on to survive. The idea that like what, what microbiology is discovering about our bi microbiomes, I'm sure there's people here who know more than me, but that not only our physical health, but maybe our mental health too is somehow tied to these trillions of creatures who live inside us. You know, there are supposedly as many microbial cells in our bodies as human cells. So even inside us, we depend on this kind of wilderness that we're cultivating. Um, so I would be very wary about ripping apart these connections to other species that we have without our understanding them. And you know, maybe COVID is, maybe not, but maybe COVID is one example of a virus spilling over from an animal population into a human population. So I don't know, I love your theory that maybe novels will eventually totally decenter the human. Uh, but we're all so drawn to human stories. And I think ultimately, whatever's happening in a novel, you have to believe in the heart and the journey of the character of the human. But I hope in this novel, I am trying to say, like, let's look around and see all these species that these characters are working with, particularly the oxen, the owl, who you got to meet briefly with Seymour, uh, who becomes a larger character in the book, and these two oxen that Omir works with. Because for a long time, the whole history of humanity, we... E.O. Wilson uses this phrase biophilia, like we, we love life, like we, our brains are trained to study plants and animals around us. Evolution gifted us with these amazing observational skills. And we don't want to sever ourselves too much from that. A severed life is an impoverished life. And so whatever ways you can see connection, I think, whether it's through literature, through attending an event like this, do getting out, hopefully going to the free libraries in-person events pretty soon. I think those are ways that we can combat depression and anxiety and also hopefully feel that connectedness that we need to pass on to our kids in order to make sure that their lives are secure. Mm. Uh, this is a great note to end on. Um, I, I loved Omar, uh, Omar's um, tree and, 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 moon, and moonlight. I mean, just amazing oxen and and um, you know they're, they're yeah you you definitely give the animals um, fellow roles in this book in a way that um, is not just simply uh, you know mascots um, uh, as as you'll see uh, the the free just put a link in the chat where you can um, you can purchase a signed copy of cloud uh, cloud cuckoo land and. All I can say is that it feels as far ranging and enthusiastic and beautiful and um, measured uh, as as the way that Tony's been speaking tonight about um, so many different topics. And I, I love this book for the fact that it it embraces many, many different things all at once. It's not simply going to put two people in a room and have them bite and snap at each other, although that could be fun sometimes, it too. Fun. It's 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 a it's a world of 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 muchness that um, in a way makes its own argument for its own preservation. Um, congratulations uh, on this book. Um, thank you so much everyone for coming. Um, uh, please pick up a signed copy. Um, this is gonna end very abruptly because all I do is touch the red leave button in the corner. So yeah. Um, yeah. thank you, Anthony, it's, it's been great to see you. And make um, sure everybody checks out Freeman's too. This is an amazing journal. John does so much work to help connect writers and readers. So everybody who you don't know, don't know about this journal, you should check it out. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anthony. Um, and thank you, the Free Library, for hosting us. Uh, have a good night. Um, walk outside and look up. Uh, make sure you look out. You know, don't do that in the middle of the road. Um, and pick up a book and enjoy it. Thank you so much. Um, take care, everyone. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye.